Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. a fork in time the alder and history podcast that's where you're going to find don and alexis and we're going to be talking into microphones and we're going to be talking about i don't know what are we likely to be talking about today lex Mm, alternate history of some sort yeah that's sort of what we do here on a fork in time and i know we mention that sort of every time we lead a podcast episode off but that's because we have to make sure we're distinguishing ourselves from another podcast we're going to talk about that here in a minute uh, but this morning, or today, or whatever time it is, it's actually in the evening, I just realized here as we're recording. I've been in this room a long time today. Well, I usually listen to podcasts in the morning, so it could be morning when you're listening to this. It could be morning, it could be afternoon, it could be like I do sometimes listening to a podcast as I fall asleep. Hopefully we're not the podcast that you choose when you want to go to sleep. I but, can't do that. Uh, the problem with that is I will fall asleep, and then I have to go back and listen to figure out where I was. Maybe that's why I don't do that. <laughs> yeah. So now that we've wandered around here for the better part of a minute, uh, welcome to A Fork in Time, the Alternate History Podcast. Don and Alexis in the dual uh, two-seat version today. And we're going to do what I'm going to call a shotgun episode today, if that makes any sense. Lex, you see where I'm going with that? Yeah. Okay. Now, we're not actually going to be talking about firearms. We're actually going to be talking about... What essentially would be a recurrent theme through history. In fact, we could have probably turned this into a four or five episode series. Yeah. Themes. Then we may come back and do that at some point because it's not limited to a couple of different places. Uh, But we're going to talk generally about a concept today that is, I guess it's probably the root of a lot of particular things that would be alternate history. It's just that we don't often think about them because they are. The way that I'm going to describe this thing when you mentioned this topic to me, Alexis, is. I don't think of this topic necessarily by its specifics as much as I think about it by its generalities, because the number of specifics that would actually exist are like... Infinite? Almost feel like they're infinite. Exactly right. And so what we're really going to be doing today, and I think we've teased it for long enough here, we're really going to be looking today at today is what if there had not been the concept throughout most of monarchical, is that a word? Sure. Yeah, why not? Go for it. Monarchical history, this idea that's known as primogenitor. And so how, just in general, might things have been different without primogenitor? Then I think we'll look at some individual examples. Like I said, this will probably lead to, actually, well, I'll actually throw this out there now. Uh, Listeners, if you have particular examples of particular episode ideas you'd like us to pursue, that's exactly why you should visit www.aforkintimepodcast.com. And uh, and see where the, the show notes are there and the topical suggestions are and all the wonderful things you can do at our very primitive but very effective little website. And one of the things you could do would be uh, suggest a particular episode, a particular instance of this. Yeah. And maybe the more obscure that reference would be, but also the more impactful, the better. So today here on A Fork in Time, we're going to look at what if there had not been primogenitor. Well, I guess a good place to start is what in the world is primogenitor, Lex? Basically... It is the concept that the first male in a bloodline gets the throne. And that that really comes into play if the first child is a female. Because if she has a younger brother, she automatically gets skipped over in primogeniture. Uh, it's always that the firstborn male, even if he could be the second, third, fourth, fifth, tenth child, gets to be the next monarch. Correct. And so there, and let me just be clear about this, we probably will spend a lot of time in one of Alexis's favorite little places on Earth, because that's where where a lot of this type of history exists, but this is not limited to the way that the English monarchy functions, correct? Correct, and that's why I'd be interested to hear from our listeners if they know some examples, specifically if they're kind of the more obscure. Maybe there's examples of this in Asia or Africa or, I mean, I think we tend to focus a lot on the European and I I tend to focus a lot on the the English, British, Scottish side of it. Um, But this happens all over the world, not just Europe, 
not just England. Yeah. And one of the things that's interesting to me, and uh, to some degree here, is that here's a pitch for our, our, our patron series on uh, Patreon, which is in the late Bronze Age Collapse. This is not necessarily something that throughout history has always been the case. The first place that jumps to mind for me is Egypt, where yeah. it was very common. In fact, it was very common in Egypt for uh, siblings to marry each other. This was the way they kept the bloodline sort of pure and did other things as well. Of course, it introduced all kinds of wonderful little inherited and anomalies and receding kind of stuff, as we've talked about in other episodes. But, for example, they're the, the a, a queen of Egypt or a queen they sort of got around this in a way in the sense that yes it was the the male who was the pharaoh for the most part but the position of the queen being just another member of the family if you if they married their sisters so that's right. that's how they solved this issue of primogenitor which is not so not necessarily what I'd recommend as the best solution for it uh, but it's that's a solution it's a solution uh, but that but that's how they solved it but for but for most of uh, but for most as you mentioned for most monarchies globally for most of history, it has been the only way that you ended up with a queen was through the accident of no male heirs. Correct. And so probably the most famous example of that, or one of the most famous examples of that, certainly in English history, would be Elizabeth the first. Well, and her older sister Mary. And her older sister Mary. Uh, and all of this, of course, when we've spent so many episodes, we didn't want to focus around the things here because this is just yet another way you could not have Henry the Eighth right become Henry the Eighth right, and the things that that came from that for him not having a a surviving male heir. heir. And so uh, we're going to talk. Well, actually, we'll we'll talk about that a little bit. I was going to say example. this gets you to know Henry the Eighth. But in a different way than we've talked about before. Right. <laughs> and as we've talked about on a number of times before, and we're not apologetic for that. It's just the reality of it for the reasons that are there. Because that's a very interesting part of history and the various what-ifs that exist there. But it's an entirely different set of what-ifs because it's an entirely different... Not different cast of characters, but different roles that the cast of characters play. Correct. If, if that's a fair way to describe it. Mm-hmm. So, again, later, so just using England as the example here, they eventually move away from this concept of primogenitor, meaning that the male gets preferred regardless of birth order. When do they finally move away from that? That would be 2015. 2015 <laughs> seems a little late. A little bit. Um, so this was finally gotten rid of as a concept with the, um, actually, I'm lying. It was 2013. Uh, this was finally gotten rid of as a concept in 2013. That is when uh, William and Catherine, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, who were the, not the second in line, but the third, uh, third in line, and then their subsequent children. This is when their first child was born, George. Of course, he happened to be a boy, but that is when they got rid of the concept so that if he had been a girl, um, she he, she would not have been superseded by a younger brother much the same way in so we had george in 2013 we had charlotte in 2015 then in 2018 we had louis um a good example of this is charlotte holds her spot she is not superseded by her younger brother because we've gotten rid of prime ginger okay so it only took well till now yeah basically <laughs> and so again a lot has happened in history a lot has happened in history because of monarchs and a lot of those monarchs either came to power or did not come to power as a result of their gender. Mm -hmm. And the timing and who it was and when it was and all of that was impacted by that. So when we come back uh, from a, just a quick break from this discussion here on the podcast, we're going to pick back up with this idea of what if there had been no primogenitor. We're going to look through, look for a couple of examples of that and just talk a little bit of flesh out a little bit about how that would be different. And I think, Really what the focus will be, since we're not going to focus so much on individual events today, would be to actually just talk about what does this mean for the general flow of history in terms of what's there. So we hope that you stick with us uh, when we pick the topic back up here in a little bit. All right, Don and Alexis here taking just a quick break from the podcast to talk about something else that's not a sponsor, it's not a product, it's not a whatever. What are we going to talk about, Lex? Another podcast. Another podcast. Is it a podcast that we know anything about? 
a, a little bit. Yeah, that podcast you might have guessed already because we've sort of not been able to not mention it almost every episode here, is The Room Where It Happened. Now, the interesting thing about The Room Where It Happened, it's another podcast uh, from our, what well, is our now family of two podcasts, but our family We're of podcasts, yeah, here at Fork in Town, we've doubled, um, is, um, is that it is, not that it's going to happen, which is what it was for some period of time, but it is now actually... Happened. And happening. Yes. And so one of the things that you can do as a listener, if you haven't already found it, if you enjoy what we do here on A Fork in Time, we suggest you to at least try out The Room Where It Happened. Now, it is a history podcast, so in that sense it is the same, but what's different about it, Lex? It is actual history. Actual history. Now, we end up talking about actual history so often while we're talking about alternate history. In fact, we've talked before about that's one of the great things of alternate history. It's a way to, to better understand and interpret the impact of actual history. Mm -hmm. But The Room Where It Happened actually doesn't focus on alternate history as its primary mode of operation. It focuses on what we call metaphorically the room. Mm -hmm. And so the room is where a location, for the most part in history, where something happened or something influential was there. And so the concept for each episode is there's a room. In fact, that's in the title of the episode. And so, for example, Lux, what was room one, room number one? It was the sitting room, living room, parlor, uh, where Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson decided the 790 Compromise. And don't forget James Madison was there. Yeah, yeah, James Madison too. So the Compromise of 1790, and it was, so, was sometimes referred to as the dinner table bargain. Mm -hmm. and in fact, as we talk about on that episode and the things that lead up to it, it's actually the inspiration from for the song and the musical Hamilton, from which the title of the podcast uh, owes... Uh, it's derivation from... And which I had stuck in my head the entire night we recorded that episode. It made it very hard to sleep, I'm just saying. Uh, there you go. Now, the other thing about that episode is that, you know, here on A Fork in Time, it might be just me, it might be just Alexis, it might be Alexis and myself, or it might be uh, Chris Chris Capola, who's our, our, our standing contributor, or any of the other folks that are there. But what's the other thing that's different or unique um, about a, a room in... The room where it happened was. <laughs> you were making some weird crossover there. Um, what's unique about it is that we are not aiming to be on every episode. Correct. We are hoping to build... We're already building a community here, but we're hoping to expand that community with the room where it happened. So we're inviting people to go to our website. We're, we haven't branched out on website yet. You still <laughs> find the room where it happened on a freaking time podcast.com. Uh, but you can go to that website, go to the tab for a room where it happened, the room where it happened, and um, you can sign up if you'd like to participate, and we want participation on all levels. Yeah, for example, our first episode, the first of the, and we'll talk a little bit, just very briefly about the format, I don't want to do the whole show about the other show, uh, but in that particular episode, we had five we had five folks that were part of the discussion there. And our goal is to have that, or maybe even sometimes a little bit more on each episode. It's a longer form podcast releasing once a month. And as Alexis just said, a lot of opportunity for interaction. And so we invite you to go to their forums on the on the uh, on the website. I was going to say we technically had six people on that episode. Because we had a contributor who wasn't there who provided questions. That's correct. We had Brody Burton from uh, from uh, Imagine If, who had who had suggested some things that we talked about with the others that were there. So, again, one of the things, uh, as Alexis just said, you can find information about that, including links to the to the to the podcast feed and other things on the website for www.aforkintimepodcast.com. The other thing you'll find is in the show notes for this particular episode. There'll be the link there, and the links that I'll include there, I think, are the links to uh, what we call the, um, it's sort of the overview show. It's the introductory episode. It gives some background, introduces the topic, and then also I include, in addition to the feed link, I'll also include the um, the actual uh, room number one. And we've already announced what the topic is for room number two, but you'll have to stay tuned for that. So anything else we need to bore the listeners about here for uh, the room where it happens, Lex? I don't think so. We hope you check it out. Like we said, it's not going to release as frequently as A Fork in Time does, but a little longer podcast and still interesting topic. So we hope you check it out. I uh, hope you do too. All right. So here we're back on A Fork in Time, the Alternative Podcast. Don and Alexis exploring uh, gender issues throughout history here, but particularly gender issues when it comes to royalty. Mm -hmm. So 
this is also one of those episodes where we didn't spend tons of time in prep. It's a little bit more of a spontaneous episode, which I like those sometimes. So, Alexis, do you even know what the origin is of the concept of primogenitor? Is it just has it all? Is there something you that you're aware of that can be pointed to? I mean, I I was kind of thinking about this kind of before we started recording and kind of off podcast. I was like, is this in the Bible, which is kind of the, when I think, you know, far away historical documents, that was kind of the first thing that popped in my head. Obviously, we have some other documents that are that old as well. But I, I was like, I'm sure this kind of concept exists in the Bible. The first thing that kind of popped in my head was, you know, King David. And it was like, going down the, the order of the sons. And it was like, not him, not him, not him, not him. Do you have any other ones? Well, I have the the youngest one. Um, of course, they were all boys in that story. But... Um, that's kind of that was kind of the the farthest back in history that my brain kind of went. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I've been I was thinking about particularly for me the same thing I mentioned. I was thinking about Egypt and how they sort of have a loophole around this in a weird kind of way, but still also not the pharaoh is the male, right? Uh, but you know, thinking about the other kingdoms and other uh, cultures that were part of what collapsed in in the Bronze Age, kings are normally kings are kings, kings are men, the, the monarchs are kings. And a great deal of that has to do, thinking back to that particular, and a lot of the stories of some of those empires as well, it has to do with, with military mm-hmm. prowess and military might. And it has to, the reason that the, the king is male is the king is expected to lead an army and lead forces. And the logical expectation of that is that that's going to be better done by a male. By a male. And it's not that the the female offspring of monarchs don't have value historically. In fact, they they tend to have value primarily through marriages, through dynastic arrangements. Uh, see one whole episode that we did on all of Victoria's kids uh, uh, spreading their genes and then spreading their recessive traits all throughout Europe at the same time. Like we said, relatives marrying, not the greatest idea. <laughs> not the great, greatest idea either, but... Uh, but again, this idea of the primary reason the king is male is because of a military bend. And so that it makes perfect sense that as long as you have a male son, mm-hmm. uh, if you're the monarch, that that should be the the monarch. Correct, yeah. So any thoughts more about that or, or, or why that plays out that way or the significance of that that may be different than what immediately comes to mind? I think you're right. I think that that is the kind of the military aspect of it. You know, the the kings were expected to to lead their troops into battle, and that was just kind of naturally what flowed through. What interestingly just popped in my head is another podcast I was listening to this week, and I believe it was Queen Queen Christina of Sweden, um, and she was actually called the king because it was like that concept didn't exist. In Sweden, so even though she was a woman and she did sit on the throne, she was not called Queen Christina. She was called King Christina. Um, so it's just it was just a weird kind of side rabbit that I chased for a second there. But yeah, I I definitely agree with you. I think that whole the military prowess and the military backing were was the kind of the reason why I was like, well, obviously it can't be a woman because they don't lead troops. So. Do you, I guess, where I would go this, we talked about keeping this more at the general sort of how this has impacted history kind of level in terms of alternate history. Do you think if that had not been the case, now this is where we get into the alternate, so this is not the case. Do you think there would have been as much conflict historically if you had more queens versus kings? I don't think so. Um... Simply because I think, and and we have examples of this in in history, and not to say that kings weren't good at this aspect of it, but I think queens have historically been known to be a little more um, diplomatic in, in their reigns. Um, so I think if we have more queens, I think we have kind of more of the impetus to let's not go to war and just get all up in arms, but let's let's come to the table and let's try and figure things. I think you would have seen more discussions, more treaties, more interconnectivity because it. I think there just would have been, again, I hate to, you know, use the kind of cliche of like, women have cooler heads, but um, I think 
you know, if we had more queens in history, I think you would have seen a little bit more of that. Let's try and talk this out and maybe not go to war immediately. Maybe use war as a last resort if we can't work this out on paper, as opposed to they just, you know, sorry, I hit the microphone. I got so excited. Um, but instead of just, you know, immediately going to war when something isn't going right and set, let's take a step back and let's try and figure this out. And then if we can't figure it out, okay, let's go to war. Yeah, I, I tend to think that's true in the sense that, you know, one of the one of the ways this has influenced history in a big way and how history was altered by or not what it would have been or, or could have been altered to is that there's males, I think, historically, just just the way that just the way we're designed, the way we are, the way the way that it is, are much more inclined to be willing, particularly if that's what the norm is, to go to war and and to, ha- and to fight it out. You know, not to say that that's I don't want to stereotype. That's what I'm trying to avoid. You're right, not, as that's I, what as, I was as, trying to avoid too. As, as I step around it, but you know, the nature of some stereotypes is they contain with them at least some element of widely recognized truth, whether that's the only reason. You know, not. Not not justifying stereotypes. That's certainly not what I'm doing. But there's a reason stereotypes do come to exist in many instances. Right. And I do think it makes a difference that, you know, it's um, males and their need to demonstrate, because that's what the position has become, demonstrate their dominance in combat and on the and on the battlefield and all the other places, you know, that, that go with that. Yeah, right. And I think you touched on something earlier where, you know, the women in history and the the princesses and the queens in history have kind of been seen as these, again, diplomatic pawns in the terms of marriages and things like that. So I think if you have more queens, it's, well, I don't have to go conquer that country. I can just marry the king. And so I'll be queen of that country as well as queen of my country. And there's nobody had to go to war. Yeah. (laughs) Now, now having said that, and it maybe is because of the fact that we've had primogenitor, I think what does happen is the very strong female monarchs throughout history really stand out, out, out stand out in a big way. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, Catherine of Russia, Sh- for yep. example. I'm thinking of oh, uh, that's a whole thing. Yeah, I'm thinking <laughs> of uh, obviously thinking of Elizabeth. I'm thinking of even even Mary standing out in a different way than Elizabeth did. I'm thinking of um, again, a lot of them just keep coming to mind here. Uh, the the other one that uh, sort of one of the other ones that immediately popped into my head, uh, which is sort of different. I'm thinking about, uh, you know, the, the Austria Hungarian. I'm thinking about uh, Maria, Maria Theresa. Theresa. Yeah, in fact, I, I'm you know I'm, rem- I'm remembering. I think this from from a world civilizations or world history class in college. Uh, there's I think there was a maybe it was a cathedral palace somewhere. If I've got this wrong, I just apologize because it popped into my head and I'm not going to research it here on the fly. But it's like the world is being held up in this thing that's on top of a steeple or something like that. And there's three different women that are recognized as being the ones that are, at that time, there were these three powerful women. Catherine of Russia being one One of of them, them. I know for sure. And, you know, so what happens because of the male dominance is when there's the opportunity for there to be a female monarch it's like more attention gets drawn to it because of the rarity. Does that make any sense? No, that that makes total sense. I think, yeah, they do kind of stand out as these beacons because they're just, they're not the norm. So, yeah, it, uh, no, that makes total sense. Yeah, in fact, the other one that just popped into my head, I, it, I'm amazed that it didn't pop into my head because it ties back to so often the area that we get wrapped around with, uh, with the English throne, you know, during the time of the Tudors. But I'm immediately thinking about a certain Spanish monarch who, uh, you know, there's Ferdinand, but then there's there's Isabella. Yeah. And, you know, he, and the interesting thing there, she was sort of known, uh, from what I understand historically, as being a sort of a warrior mm-hmm. queen. So she was... She wore the metaphorical pants in that relationship. Yeah. And so she also, again, <laughs> this ties back to the idea of how primogenitor has, has, has created the situation for history. She sort of had to almost put on this... I think it was her personality, but this persona where she was a female, but she was a strong right. female that was able to even exude influence mm-hmm. or exert influence in that way. Yes. If that makes any sense. No, that make again, that makes total sense. Okay. So carrying this concept forward, again, we're looking at the big sweep here. 
other than just the fact that we live in a more modern world, equality of sexes, all the things that go that go with that, what do you think is the other reason that we finally see primogenitor going away? I th- I think it's be honestly, I think it's because the queens that we've had have been so influential. Um and I think part of that is due to the fact that they've maybe had to um you know, exert themselves a little bit more and kind of prove themselves a little bit more. But I think the world is finally realizing that, and I think, you know, Elizabeth II is probably a good good example of this just because she's been queen for so long. I mean, she's about to celebrate next year her platinum jubilee, I think it is. Um, She's literally the longest reigning British monarch, male or female. Um, I think that's just, it's, I think we, as a as a society and as a world, I think we've come to realize people's achievements separate from their from their sex. Um, so it's just they're a great leader, regardless of if they're male or female. Um, and so I think the world is just is just going that way, and it it just happens that we're uh, having more equality and things like that in the world. But I think I think we're just realizing that. A good leader is a good leader regardless of what gender they are. Yeah. And, of course, the other thing that's happened, we talk about this being modern, it's not like the world is ruled by monarchies now either. Right. And so even where, not to say that Elizabeth is not an important personage in 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 English culture and in English politics, but she's not the prime minister. Correct. And... It, so the fact that, and the fact that, you know, if, if George had been Georgette, it would have been okay. Right. Uh, is, 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 is great. But we're also talking about what is now considered more of a symbolic figurehead role position. And so, you know, again, that, the irony of that to me is that even in this age of uh, more gender equality, more rise in recognition for the status of women, it's only now when the position doesn't matter so much that you actually are allowing women to be in the position, if that makes any sense. There, there's there's a certain sense of irony attached to that. No, there there is. It's kind of like, well, now that you're now that you're symbolic, we don't we don't really care. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, so if, for example, I'm immediately thinking about you know during Elizabeth II's reign, there have been female prime ministers. I guess there have been two, right? Female prime ministers. Um. Thatcher and. Uh, I can see her face, and I'm yeah, I've got blanking like, on, on her I've name. I've got her name as well. Uh, we apologize to <laughs> Theresa May. Her, Theresa May, thank you. We apologize to our English listeners. Um, but there have been two female prime ministers during her reign. Uh, that was unique. That was new. Yep. And, you know, even though the, 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 the monarchy there, you know, is no longer being held by primogenitor, the good news is the actual electoral position, the actual political position was advancing even before that was. There was a female prime minister. In fact, there were two female prime ministers before there was direct, without accidentally backing into it. Yeah, without some... Queens. Son, brother jumping. (laughs) Which leads you back, I know know, your favorite term is the cousin jump. Yeah. But, you know, you have the gender jump and the other things that happen because of of this going on. Mm Mm-hmm. So, you mentioned one other example. What was that? Um, so... The the first the example that kind of kicked this off in my head, and then I then it kind of branched off, and I thought about other ones. Again, we mentioned at the beginning we were going to get to a no Henry the Eighth, but in a different way. Um, and the way we were going to get to a no Henry Eighth, no Henry the Eighth under this concept is, of course, we we've talked about his older brother Arthur uh, plenty of times uh, on this podcast before, but he actually has an older sister as well, his older sister Margaret. And she ends up, she's queen. She's queen. She's just not queen of... England. She's queen of... Scotland. Yeah. And so, she was the oldest. She was the oldest girl. Arthur was the oldest. Right. So, Arthur dies. Yes. In either scenario, no no, no we, King, we no King, no King Arthur, Arthur. Because, because we have a, we have a dead Arthur, right? He, he dies before his, before his father, so we have no King Arthur in any scenario. But Margaret yeah. is very much alive. Right? Yes. Yes. She is very much alive. I'm blanking on when she actually goes up to Scotland and marries the king, but it's 
around the time of her father's death. So she is very much around and a player in this right. scenario. And then Henry becomes king. Correct. Her, bro her brother Henry becomes king. And the result of that is Henry VIII is now on the throne of England. Margaret is married to a uh, James. James IV. James IV of Scotland. And that does some things with respect to the the tensions that had existed between the English and Scottish thrones. But ultimately what happens there is there's a unification of the English and Scottish thrones under James the first slash James the sixth, mm -hmm. uh, James the sixth of Scotland, who has the rightful claim to the English throne when Elizabeth dies with no heir. heir. And so you have the union of the English and Scottish thrones under James James I of England, James VI of Scotland. He's the James of King James Bible fame. Yep. The thing to recognize there is that whole path... Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. And why, why does it not happen? Be under If there's no primogenitor. Because we have no Margaret that needs to go north to find a husband. Mar Mar Margaret can be queen. She doesn't have to go marry to be queen. She can be queen, queen in her own right. And of course, you know... Then you get into all the various ways that the, the, the billiard balls bounce off of that and how that rolls through history. But one of the ways you might potentially argue, ultimately you might have, you probably do have some union of English and Scottish territory and the crowns there, but not the way it did happen. Correct. I mean, it, it could have happened... Basically, they could have married each other, but just kind of in the reverse situation where Margaret becomes Queen of England and she decides she's going to marry the King of Scotland to you now that way. But still, she's Queen of England in her own right. It could be a situation of their kids marry each other. So you could eventually get to the same place, and I'm using air quotes because you can't see me. Um, you could get to the same place, but, but it's kind of, we've talked about this before, you get to... What you think is the same place, but it's not the same players because you've changed this one thing. Right. And so, and, and the result of changing that thing is you have the same people in different roles, which means that things play out. You may get to the same end result, but it plays out in a different way so that it is different. Right. And whether that's a big difference or a small difference, you know, that's, that's the interesting thing about alternate history. I guess the other one you mentioned actually related to later in English history, and that was Victoria, correct? Yeah, so again, same thing with Victoria. Of course, we've talked about her children, and we've even mentioned uh, her oldest child on a previous episode of the podcast. So her oldest child is actually not uh, Edward VII, her son. It's actually her daughter, Victoria, uh, who's born. And Victoria, again, because we don't have this concept of primogeniture, or we still have the concept of primogeniture, um, the firstborn does not automatically get the throne, so she actually goes over to this little country called Germany to find her husband and has this little boy named Wilhelm. Yeah, this is one of those shame instances when we don't have you don't have a good Chris Coppola around to uh, um, to talk about oh, Kaiser, how we don't get to World War One. <laughs> yeah, Kaiser Wilhelm here. But again, that that's just another example of does that mean that they're doesn't the Germany the Germany that arises is not the Germany that arises that becomes the Germany of World War One the German maybe maybe not you know then it's the bigger questions of history kind of of scenario but it's an interesting what if and it all ties back to whether it's even necessary for female children of monarchs based upon their age in terms of the order of succession in terms of the, their birth order whether it's required for them to leave or not. Right. In fact, I'm remembering now the PBS series Victoria. Um, there's a scene between Queen Victoria and her son, who eventually does become Edward VII, and he's basically saying, like, you know, I'm not going to amount to anything, because obviously Vicky's going to be, and, you know, she's having to explain, like, no, you're the next heir because you're a boy. Um, so, yeah, it's just an interesting, interesting thing, thing to think about. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I don't know. Again, we, this is one of those off the cuff. We talked about it conceptually, didn't want to get into a lot of detail here, but what we do want to encourage is if you can think of very particular, interesting twists. Where I was going to say, I've got a couple more in my head, but again, they're all English and yeah. I know we got other options here. Well, the, the other thing that's interesting to me that even occurred to me, because I looked over my bookshelf and actually saw the novels over there. Yes, the novels. He actually wrote novels. 
There was a time in history, you may not believe this, when Jar George R. R. Martin wrote and actually published and released hold on to hold on Lex books. He had this whole series. Now he's published other books. He won't actually finish the series. As I say, I'm going to have to go back and read the entire series again by the time the next one comes out. But the reason that that popped into my head for those of you that are that are Game of Thrones fans or know there is that one of the things that's actually dealt with in some of the more intricate subplots, primarily in the books, not so much in the HBO miniseries, or miniseries, the HBO series, Please. is this idea of one of the particular kingdoms, uh, Dorne. Right does not hold to primogenitor. Correct. And so that alters and can change what can happen because they're not bound by the same stipulations and that ends up producing a mar some marriages. Other things happen in the in the plot of the books. And of course Martin is stealing heavily where from where he's stealing heavily from real history there. And the fact that that wasn't always the case even in all of the realms and dominions that were associated with England. Correct. Yeah. Or in Europe. And so he, he's stealing and borrowing that and looking at how that would be the potential what if in a fictional world, which then, you know, ties back and mirrors back over to the real world. I just, again, I'm looking over the bookshelf and saw that. And so that popped into my head. Well, all right. We thank you for joining us here on A Fork in Time. We do encourage you to check out the, the website, www.aforkintimepodcast.com. You'll find all the good stuff there, how to uh, give topical suggestions, how to give feedback, how to become a patron and support the show if that's something you feel inclined to do. Just all the things that are there. Anything else we want to mention to listeners, Lux? Uh, go check out The Room Where It Happened. Yeah, we encourage you to do that. Uh, we think you might enjoy it. Again, it's a much longer form podcast, but only once a month. And uh, room number one exists. Room number two is the topic has been chosen. The die has been cast. All we have to do is set the recording date for that, which will be here in the coming days. And we'll continue along that path. We're excited to have launched the second podcast. It was uh, from its first conception in the March-April time frame to now, it's been a long time coming. If it just shows you anything about how much fun we have doing this podcast, we were literally on the phone call for, I think, an hour and a half after we stopped recording. I agree. In fact, one of the things I was tempted to do, uh, except I didn't have the recording of all that discussion because we had stopped with the recording by that point, was we had a great conversation with, if you will, the, I don't, even, I don't like using the word cast, but the hosts or the, or the, the panelists. The panel. There you go. The panel. The panel for room number one, we had a great time talking just afterwards about the subjects, but also talking about other stuff. And uh, I'm glad you brought that up, Alexis, because we mentioned it all the time. But that's one of the things I've enjoyed most about this now two plus year journey is meeting people that are, you know, kindred spirits that have a love of history and have very diverse backgrounds and very diverse understanding of things. And that's one of the things that we enjoy. So if you're one of our listeners, you're in that group. We like to think of you as being part of the extended Fork in Time family. And we appreciate you uh, giving us a little time today to ramble on generically, but somewhat importantly about uh, whether it matters, whether that firstborn child of a monarch is male, male or, or female. female. It actually matters. So uh, we're going to remind you, as we always do, we happen to think that if you happen upon a fork in time, you probably ought to do what, Lex? Take it. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Learn more and provide feedback by visiting our website at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Connect to us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash aforkintime or follow us on Twitter at A-F-I-T podcast. If you want to support the show financially, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash aforkintime. We hope you will join us next time. <laughs>